Welcome everyone to the We Can Do This podcast, Kiss the Ground's weekly conversation about how you can participate in the healing of ourselves and our earth as we are one and the same. My name is Rylan Engelhart. I will be your co-host. I'm also the executive director and co-founder of Kiss the Ground. And we also have Jessica Handy here, uh, who is our co-host and uh, manages all partnerships with Kiss the Ground. And our mission, Jessica, our mission is to to awaken. Let's try that again. Yeah, our our mission is to awaken people to the possibilities of regeneration. Awaken people to the possibilities of regeneration. Uh, Awesome. Uh, Michael Martinez, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. And uh, Jessica, you want to share a little bit about Michael's background? Yeah, no, super honored to have you on, Michael. Um, I know we have some history as a, both organizations working in LA and um, the broader broader communities. And um, yeah, just really grateful to have you. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and read your bio so our audience that's not familiar with your work can learn a little bit about who you are. Um, so Michael Martinez is a certified master gardener, a former elementary school teacher, and the founder and executive director of LA Compost the vision for a community-wide ecosystem of compost hubs throughout Los Angeles began when Michael was teaching fifth grade and running his school's first edible garden. Today, LA Compost manages four composting hubs in the city of Los Angeles and educates children and adults about composting through workshops, after-school programs, and events. Michael believes that the school is the heartbeat of our food system, and LA Compost is working to create a strategic program that will, um, a strategic program that will keep food waste out of landfills, provide quality soil to community gardens, and educate the community about completing the farm to table uh, soil circle. Thank you, Michael, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you both for for setting aside the time for this conversation. Absolutely, and I, I, I was just, I recently had a conversation with Michael, you know, sharing, uh, some good, exciting news about the Kiss the Ground film um, is likely going to be coming out on Netflix in September, and just that he has a really, really beautiful sequence um, in the film sharing about LA compost and compost in general. And even though me and Michael haven't had that much personal time together, I was sharing that I, I, I've, I've seen that sequence so many times, I feel like I, I actually know you better um, because I've, you know, you've been in my periphery so much. Um, through the last many years of that film being in development. So, um, and then also, you know, one other point of connection was the first Kiss the Ground garden in Venice uh, that we developed. You ended up putting a beautiful composting hub, uh, an LA compost hub there um, in that garden at Beyond Baroque, so. Yeah, still going strong to this day. We're excited to still be there. Yeah, thank you for that. Absolutely. Welcome. Um, Beautiful. So, uh, Jessica, you want to jump in with our first question today? Yeah, I'll kick off our first question, which is a fun one. Um, basically, we just would love to know what your earliest memory, um, where you felt deeply connected with nature. Yeah, um, I feel like for me, I grew up here in Los Angeles, more on like the east side, like, like San Diego Valley. And for me, uh, my parents did a really good job of making sure that my brother, sister, and I were just always outside, uh, either to get them out of their hair or just to like encourage us to explore and imagine and create. Uh, but I would say the earliest memory is where I felt truly connected to what is life and kind of somewhat of an inhale, exhale experience with, with, with what was around me was just in the trees, my, my grandfather was a carpenter and both him and my father built my brother and I a tree house when we were very young um, in this huge avocado tree. And for me, it was just playing in that tree house, spending the night in that tree house, uh, thinking I was the most brave human being on this earth by spending a night in a cool weathered Southern California evening. But I don't know, I just feel like being in the branches of the tree, like coexisting well with that, sharing the space of that, um, I feel like for me, it was like that moment was truly sacred and really left an imprint in my mind as far as what it means to be one and connected and one in the same in many ways. So for me, it was playing in an avocado tree in a tree house built by, by my grandfather. Uh, it was very, very much so one of the earliest memories and one of the most profound memories for me. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank goodness for parents and grandparents for planting those seeds literally and, you know. And- Absolutely. 
was that was that house or was that tree behind your grandfather's house or where where did it was the tree was it was in it was in my parents backyard so it was it was at my house my grandfather built it and it was there up until college i want to say and um between like the tree growing and and, and plants changing it, it unfortunately is no longer there but it was just a simple a simple, simple gift that my grandfather gave to my brother and I that just left a huge imprint in regards to just being able to be in the shade of a tree and its canopy providing the coolness and the imaginative landscape for us to, to really play and create for many years. But um, yeah, it's very, very fortunate to have that, that memory and experience for sure. Mm. The, the miracle of a tree and what it provides. I, I just moved um, out to Fillmore, California, which is pretty hot. And during, you know, a hot day right now, it will be, you know, 90, 95 degrees in the sun. And we have a mulberry tree uh, on our property. And literally, I can go under the mulberry tree. And literally, it's a different world. It's, it's just um, like, it's like there's a breeze, there's a coolness. I mean, it's literally like 25 degrees cooler under. Yeah, you're transformed to another, another. Place. <laughs> it's like, it's, 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 and, you, and you want that for everyone, right? You want that experience. You want everyone to have that experience, you know, whether it's in the backyard, on their sidewalk, in the green space. And, and I think having that experience uh, makes you want to experience it again, but also want to share that with others. So I, I totally agree with you. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I can remember someone saying something profound to me around when we're touched by nature, we then have a responsibility and a, and a, a commitment to protect it and, can, and yeah, and care for it. Yeah. Well, beautiful, Michael. Yeah, the our, our because I actually know a little bit about the organization, but I, I'd love to know kind of why, why compost and what was your aha moment? Uh, around and maybe there wasn't an aha moment. Well, maybe it was a, a, a slow, gradual. But you know, what was the journey that led to the creation of LA Compost? Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, my 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 mother and father always kind of encouraged us to be outside, and we had a garden growing up, and and my grandfather had a garden and fruit trees and all that. But it wasn't really until I was a, a teacher in Miami, Florida. I'm born and raised here in LA, and was actually able to teach for a few years in Miami, Florida and, and Little Haiti. And uh, it was actually in that experience that I kind of, where the seeds of LA compost kind of germinated. And I say that because speaking of trees, I would often use like analogies in my classroom. I was a reading and writing teacher. And for some reason I thought it would be a good idea to hold like a, a, a citrus seed in my pocket and pull it out mid lesson to talk to my students about uh, trees and growth and, and potential and and I walk through that analogy and it's an analogy we've all heard as far as like this seed represents you there's going to be things that come along that uh, will support your growth that will nurture you that will allow you for, for you to grow into something really profound and beautiful and there are going to be some things that make it difficult along the way and what I wanted to kind of hit home with with this analogy was their growth and potential wasn't just about themselves it was about the shade they were going to provide uh, the food and organic matter that they were going to provide for the roots, uh, the safety and structure that they were going to provide for the community around them. And, and I really thought I was vibing with my students. They were kind of like nodding and perhaps they were just lying to, or they were just like, yeah, we get it. And then all of a sudden, one of my students literally asked, so Mr. Martinez, I kid you not, asked, so how do Cheetos grow? And that, that, that question kind of like struck me. I was like, is he playing with me? Like, is he, is, is he met? But he had a serious look on his face. So I was like, all right, let's use it as a teachable moment. So we kind of said, oh, I was like, well, where do carrots come from? To which he responded, oh, they come from the local grocery store, Publix in, in South Florida. I said, okay, cool. Where does Publix get their carrots from? Uh, from the big truck that obviously delivers it. And I asked like, well, where does the big truck get it from? And that's kind of where the conversation stopped. It was like, it turned kind of defensive of like, well, I, I don't know. I'm not a farmer. Aren't you supposed to teach us how to read kind of thing? And it was there where I realized the level of, disconnect from from food where it comes from and what we are consuming on a daily basis and in no way shape or form was the aha moment trying to turn my fifth grade students into master gardeners dietitians or nutritionists but how do we expose them to a, a, a world in the same way the the coolness of a the canopy of a tree how do we expose them 
to a world that allows them to make and construct their own knowledge. So for me, I'm a firm believer as a former teacher that education is only as strong as uh, the access and opportunity to put what was learned into practice. Um, because I can tell them about experiences. I can read a book about compost, about strawberries, about cauliflower and beautiful fruits, but it's a whole, it, it takes it to a whole nother level when they can create those experiences on their own and the learning becomes in the doing. Um, so that school garden that we had, it was a little after school garden club that we had. We started off with like nine kids. At its peak, it had like 45 kids. And then I realized some of the kids that were joining that garden club were not even from our school. Uh, some of the kids were inviting their friends and cousins and neighbors from, a, from around the neighborhood. And it was in that space where it was just like understanding the full story of food uh, from seed to harvest, from harvest back to the compost, compost, and, and really showing that full cycle. And for me, what was transformative was students seeing themselves as part of something bigger than themselves, feeling like they contribute to the conversation, feeling like they brought value and uh, just the space that we were able to create was really beautiful in the sense that um, the diversity of the group created the wholeness, created the richness, created the depth of the conversations, created the depth of that, that space in that club. And for me, it was like, that was one of the most life-giving experiences I had as a teacher was not actually in the classroom, but just being in a green space in Miami with my students. And for me, uh, I wanted to recreate that, really talk about the full story of food um, in a way that focused on um, topics that weren't often discussed, like food scraps and compost and soil health. And this was very true in Miami where it's all sandy soil. So uh, as you try to plant the tree, you got you realize how quickly water drains, the lack of structure in the soil. So the aha moment for me was very much that question that one of my one of the students posed to me in that classroom. But um, I would say it was a gradual, gradual aha moment over a, over many years of being outside, of working with uh, just working in the garden, working in different community gardens to then being able to start nothing profound, but a small green space for my students to interact and engage with. And that's kind of where LA Compost launched because um, I knew LA was home. It always is and will be, at least in my mind. And uh, that garden in Miami is still going to this day, which I'm excited to hear. Uh, but I wanted to figure out how, how we could create those transformative experiences that allow people to construct their own knowledge, participate in shared life-giving experiences um, in ways that they feel valued, they feel heard, and they feel that they can contribute. Because for me, compost is very much like a reflection of what can take place above the ground at the community level as well. Um, yeah, and I, I guess I would say like, that's kind of where the seeds of LA Compost were planted. Mm. There's so mm. many ways, that's beautiful. <clears throat> so many layers. Um, that come out of connecting the soil and food and the land. And um, sounds like a really transformative experience as you as a teacher and then transitioning and, you know, to LA Compost and where a lot of that inspiration comes from in the work that you do with LA Compost. Um, yeah, I guess my next question is in the journey of developing and um, building uh, LA Compost, what have you found to be the most, uh, I guess, areas of satisfaction and where have you uh, found some like stumbling blocks along the way? Yeah, I would say the areas that I'm just like humbled each time I, I experience is this profound reflection on like the human network and like the the small individual goodness, the small individual acts of like positivity that are taking place every single day. Like for me, the thing that I reflect on a lot is like we are in LA County. We have 10.2 million people. It is the most populous county in the country. If it was its own state by population, LA County would be the eighth most populous state. There's just a lot of people here. And I think for me, reflecting on the strength of the soil and the way in which communications happen below the ground, how do those communications, interactions, and life transfers take place above the ground as well? And we see it. Uh, I think for us, what's beautiful is that we kind of take a, a decentralized approach where it is no one central hub. It is a collection of a variety of hubs in spaces where people naturally do life. Uh, for me, how do we allow our work to mimic what compost does so well? Compost complements, it adds value, it adds structure, it adds uh, life and energy to something that is already established or that is growing. And for us, every single one of our hubs and program offerings is in partnership with the community organization. So the strength of our work is very much so with the partners that we've established over the years. Uh, but going back to your question, I feel like 
for us, it's how like the human network that we are building across the most populous county in the country is, is what excites me. It's not one single hub at a large park. It's not one single compost distribution center. It's the thousands and potentially millions of people who call Los Angeles home, understanding where food comes from, understanding how soil is built, understanding uh, basic human interaction and connections and how we bring life and add life and value to one another. Um, and I guess the barriers and, and things that I feel um, that I would consider a barrier is, is just the, the access to space and being able to create this in an equitable way and not just concentrating these efforts in communities that have farmers markets and parks and gardens, but how do we allow for deep community engagement and for co-creation to take place? I think for me, one of the things that I wanna be really mindful of is Oftentimes communities know what they need. They always know what they need. They know how, how it can happen. They, they, so I think for us, it's like, I wanna say one of the barriers is how do I become a better listener? How do we enter spaces and work and co-create uh, with communities that allows for, um, in many ways, a reclaiming of the story and narrative that they wanna tell? Um, and how do we get support um, at various levels to support these efforts. So um, that's not so much of a clear answer because I could easily say, oh, a barrier is money, a barrier is policy, a barrier is space. But I think a barrier is just like the way in which we do this work in a true level of community engagement and adding depth to that, I would say. Mm, that's really beautiful. And I think it's so important. A great reminder is, you know, for ourselves and other organizations that work in community and that, you know, we remember that oftentimes these communities have the knowledge it's just a matter of access to resources and and um and and just being being listened to this is really beautiful that you know you're approaching your work with that lens and you know how can we serve these communities that no, may not necessarily have the, the resources but really have the know-how but just need a little extra support in in building their vision absolutely yeah i, I i'm yeah i'm just i'm inspired by yeah, the, the reflection of um, becoming a better listener. Uh, I think that right now for myself, you know, as running an organization and, you know, really looking at how to become more inclusive and not just be kind of so mono focused on my objective and just seeing how uh, well intended my intention could be and how uh how domineering and kind of uh extractive um just having an intention to do something versus really um you know being a better listener as like uh i, I mean i think that's really it, it's something i'm deeply deeply learning in this moment um and really yeah slow, slowing down and uh becoming a better listener is definitely uh the thing that i'm most challenged by and most grateful to be learning humbled to be learning at 40 years old um and uh you know in the face of thinking that i was a good listener and that, um so yeah i really appreciate that that um perspective and and that uh, that that's where you're really looking at how you're um, and, yeah yeah and I think it's I think it speaks to this network mentality right like if we look at the way trees or life communicates and one once plant needs something and how nutrients or water are shared like how, how are we doing that as well as far as like listening being present and maybe it's not coming from us but within our larger network we know something can be provided to a group a community a space in uh that is in need. And I feel like it's just uh, so powerful as we grow this network, as we grow these partnerships to identify areas of strength and areas of support that can be shared and pass, pass through us, not come from us, um, yeah. I think is, is, is very much important as well. And I think that, that supports just the, the longevity of the work that's being done. If you, you, you're, you're listening deeply and, and allow the community to be as, invest, as deeply invested in the vision and the project as, we are as a, a support organization coming in to, to help build. 
um, it's vital and it's essential to um, to any work that's done in community. Absolutely, Michael, as as a as a leader and community organizer um, and running an organization, and how do you you know how do you stay grounded? How do you stay clear? How do you stay compassionate, kind with all the stresses of life? Do you have um, do you have a, a practice or a something that you you do that really has you connects you back to your center yeah um i would say just coming home after work uh really does that for me um my wife and two little ones are are that center for me as far as just not seeing me as someone who's running an organization or someone who's been in and around compost pile all the time but just as 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 family as life as as someone that is is loved and respected and cared for, and I think being around my two sons is is very much a grounding experience for me. Um, I don't have a lot of per se self care practices at the moment, as being a father of two little ones and getting uh, lim not like small amounts of rest, but um, just being with them and and experiencing their curiosity and seeing how their imagination flows just brings me life and joy as far as how I can be a part of that and help uh, not, not guide that, but just ex like, just be present and coexist with them in, in those moments of creation and mm -hmm. um, construction of knowledge and, and, and new thoughts and ideas. And um, obviously we're a lot home, we're home a lot more during the season. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so times and moments of creation and using our imagination are at an all time high. Um, but for me, what grounds me is very much being with family um, to this day, I still schedule uh, a time to turn the compost pile every week, um, even though a majority of my work is coordinating, uh, establishing new partners, building new sites, et cetera. For me, going back to why this work started and why we started this work and, and the very physical aspect of this work is very important to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's a weekly reminder of the potential of what it is we are capable of doing. Um, and I never want to lose touch of that. Um, I, the physical act of turning the compost pile, seeing the steam, seeing the life, seeing the transformation within just a short period of time is something I never want to lose. Um, and it's, it's an incredible opportunity for me to stay grounded, for me to stay connected, for me to connect with volunteers, community members, and my staff in a way that uh, I never kind of drift away from from the root of this work as well. Mm. And Michael, I know uh, Ryan and I are really familiar with your work, but um, to step back a little bit um, and speaking of just your, you scheduling time to turn your compost, I know that's a part of the work of LA Compost, but if you can give um, listeners a, a nice scope of, of what a day in the life of LA Compost staff, what that, what that looks like for you all. Um, I know yeah. it's a little different and probably in this, this moment in time when we're dealing with a global pandemic, but um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to, to hear about the work and the community that, the communities that you serve. Yeah, so our work is very much kind of centered in three, three buckets per se, um, focused on individual community and regional access and engagement. So at the individual level, uh, there's programs centered around workshops, work days, uh, farmers market food scrap drop off locations throughout the city, um, and really engage in the one-to-one -one individual uh, as far as um, education and opportunity to participate in this work. Uh, our community model is very much our oldest model, and that's kind of a cooperative hub model that allows for multiple participants to engage collectively in the creation of compost at the community level. This is at schools, churches, community gardens, uh, parks, apartment complexes, anywhere where there's a space uh, and the ability to tell the full story of food, we kind of come alongside an existing organization to do that. And then at the regional level, we have larger spaces that are at parks and urban farms where, where you are composting on a little bit of a larger scale. Uh, I think what, what, I, what I'm proud of in regards to what the makeup of our team is that they very much look and represent Los Angeles mm -hmm. in regards to the, and the, and the, the fact that our compost managers that manage the compost hubs are from the areas in which they're serving. Um, so we have six areas um, throughout Los Angeles and I think what's great is the compost managers from those areas have built partnerships, connections, and relationships with those communities much, much 
they built relationships and partnerships with communities prior to even working with LA Compost. Mm -hmm. um, but a compost manager is not just someone who turns a pile or teaches a workshop. It's very much so a Swiss army knife of skill sets that we're trying to establish where um, they're leading workshops, they're establishing soil farmer programs, they are launching new hubs, they are participating in, in the food scrap backhauls from farmers markets. But uh, what a typical shift looks like for a compost manager varies day to day. But um, from what I've seen, what I've experienced is uh, it's very much so accepting a lot of food scraps from a certain source, whether that's a restaurant, farmer's market, community gathering, and it's preparing the pile. Uh, it's, it's maintaining the pile. It's turn, turning, watering, sifting, uh, caring for our worms, uh, and building the soil and teaching along the way. Uh, it's typically uh, at any given time, a two to three hour shift um, within, a, within a portion of their day where they are physically uh, active and engaged in that. And for me, it's something that I wanna make more available and accessible once things open up uh, for more people to participate. Um, it goes back to this idea of moments in our lives that leave an imprint or have a strong impression of us. And for me, if you turn a large windrow of compost in LA um, under a tree, it's just, it's, it's, it's a beautiful experience to see, to see what we consider waste to be transformed into this beautiful, valuable, rich compost that, that we all covet and seek. Um, but yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. The, one of the things that we're oftentimes, you know, speaking about as Kiss the Ground and philosophically speaking around, you know, as we connect more deeply with nature um, and touching soil and um, participating on a piece of land that there's not only, you know, healing that takes place on that land level, but there's emotional healing that takes place. And I'm just curious if you have any examples or experiences or stories to tell of watching, you know, as you introduce lots of people in different communities to tending to compost, tending to soil, tending to gardens, um, stories of people who, you know, you, you've started to see healing, emotional healing uh, happen while they're tending to this kind of physical earthly healing um, process of compost. Yeah, um, I think one of the things that I've seen just time and time again is, is the way the volunteers and people within the community show up and continue to show up in a way where they're drawn to this work, they are drawn to the spaces that we are creating because of the very fact of those human and social interactions and exchanges of life and energy taking place. Um, and I would say for, for one example is, there was one individual who was a volunteer with us at one of our hubs in the Valley who would come and literally sift compost for two hours every Saturday in the morning. And we were always like, we often questioned like, oh, we appreciate the commitment. Um, just curious, like why, why do you enjoy doing this or what, what brings you back? And uh, I think one of the responses was like the ability to be still, the ability mm -hmm. to, be, like, to be connected with living soil or living compost for a few hours and talk with my sister. This is the, the time that we actually get to talk throughout the week of our busy, hectic uh, schedules. And like we literally come on Saturday, sift for two hours and have wonderful like interactions Mm -hmm. and are able to communicate in ways in which our, our work life busyness doesn't allow for that to happen. And one of those, we, we labeled them, one of them was, a, they were the Sifting Sisters. Uh, one of them actually works for us now and is now the compost manager of the space in which she sifted for over a year. And um, I wouldn't say it was emotionally healing, but it was very much so just creating a space to allow for, for transits of life to take place. I know it's, it sounds, so simple of just being able to have a conversation with a sister or being able to show up and uh, just do life with one another. But I think for me, the way in which these hubs attract and allow for people to not only work, but engage with our staff on deeper levels. Some of our staff members have created some really incredible relationships with our volunteers where after the compost turn, they always go out for lunch or after the compost turn, they always do something that, that transcends the work itself in, in ways that create a level of depth to human relationships. And um, I think to me, that's so beautiful in regards to how when they're doing the work, they can kind of breathe and not think about the stress and anxiety that may, they may have come with um, and how 
they can allow for the compost pile to just occupy their space and occupy um, perhaps even their mind in regards to their role in all of this and create a level of res perspective and refocus in that. Um, it does that for me um, very much so. Like my individual contributions are not much, uh, but the compost pile is a beautiful reminder that it is the many that is creating something that is powerful and life-giving. Um, and I think it does that for others as well when they are able to engage with that um, in whatever way that is. And, um, at our hub in their backyard in their own garden on a parkway um, it's those beautiful glimpses and reminders that kind of recalibrate um, our soul and, and focus mm. yeah it, that's beautiful and you know composting it's been a passion of mine for so long and I would say definitely LA compost was kind of in the first um, was was you know you guys have been one of the organizations that has really inspired me to step up my composting game um, in terms of just, you know, composting at home and, and then when you're out in the world traveling or going from, you know, one city to the next, you get, I mean, at least personally, I've, I've gotten to this point where I, I can't throw food away. And LA Compost, you, you've made it to the point where I, you know, I know where the hubs are and um, I, I travel with my food scraps and find places to drop my food off when I'm not home. Um, and I, I, I find that it's, it's, it's a really beautiful way to, to give back to the land and, and connect with people, as you mentioned, um, in, in the process of, of, of feeding the soil and in feeding ourselves um, through the process of returning the, that compost back to the, to the land to grow healthy food. Um, it's such a beautiful way to connect community and um, I've always been inspired by, by your work and has really helped um, me along in my journey in composting. So thank you. Yeah, and I can, I can testify that <laughs> I've been with Jessica at uh, events and other places and she is <laughs> collecting compost and that will go back to the earth. That is not going. <laughs> um, yeah, a yeah. little extreme at times, which is funny. I will, you know, if I'm in, a, in another state, um, I, know I was in uh, New York last year and carried a banana peel with me for blocks and I finally found a little tree I had a little patch of soil around it and I looked around to see if anyone was watching and I had dug my heel in the soil plant like planted that banana peel and covered it up and you know it's a really simple gesture but just a way of again just saying thank you to nature and and really closing that loop so those you know we're returning turning it back to the soil where it belongs absolutely yeah that's great it's beautiful yeah and I I, I just want to say it, it's it, it's so true how you know, in, in all the things that we can spend our day doing and, you know, as we find ourselves getting older and running organizations and being responsible for managing people and, you know, things and budgets and uh, I can absolutely remember, you know, going from all the kind of busyness and significance of life and going back to either my garden or my compost bin and finding more peace and satisfaction with my little earth machine than, you know, uh, all, all kinds of, you know, uh, you know, big important things. And um, yeah, so it, it, it really is. And even just, you know, in the last, um, in the last few months or the last month being, you know, coming out here to Fillmore and, you know, I'm on the Zoom you know, meetings and work from the computer. And boy, am I excited at the end of the day to go and, you know, dig around in my garden and, you know, plant a tree and, you know, uh, figure out how I'm going to, you know, dilute my uh, chicken compost tea that I'm, that I'm brewing up. And I mean, it's just, it, <laughs> it's amazing how much satisfaction, um, yeah, comes from, you know, that, that act of participating in um, something that gives to life. Mm -hmm. So it's beautiful, Michael. Yeah, I feel like we're, we're so, I mean, I don't wanna speak for all of us, but we're, we're very much overstimulated now, right? Uh, from, from screens to our worlds being minimized to five to six inches of a phone. And I, I love it when students visit our spaces and I just put a bunch of worms in their hand and it's just like a shock, wow, transfer of life, recalibration, reboot of the system kind of moment um, because they are, they are holding life and they are 
experiencing something beautiful as far as just being still and being present in that moment. And for us, it's how do we create those moments of stillness of, of, of just reflection and recalibration in many ways. Mm -hmm. Michael, I'm curious with your two kiddos, how has it been <laughs> raising two young boys and well, one being, I see you as like the LA compost or LA, um, yeah, LA compost king and just really helping to inspire LA to, to take composting to another level. But going back to your home life, I'm just curious how that, what that experience is for your wife and your kids and what the conversations and practices are around compost. Yeah, it's, it's very much uh, present in our home as far as like saving our food scraps, reading them and uh, taking my sons to the different hubs and community areas where we compost. Uh, my son is also at this cooperative outdoor kind of preschool uh, where uh, we actually were able to support a garden and a little composting there as well. And I think it was so funny because when I, when I went to kind of go talk about compost and, and set that up, he was like so proud to walk up there with me and act as like the co-facilitator of teacher and uh, trying to explain to his three and four year old peers like what compost was and what the worm does and uh, very much connected. Uh, I, I take my older three year old with me to, to a lot of the spaces just to um, expose him to, to different green and growing spaces throughout LA. Uh, but I love that it's just normal to him mm. that uh, to climb a windrow of, of compost, to, to dig his hands in the soil, to hold worms, to hold uh, ladybugs with such grace and respect and care. And I think for me, it's like, um, I, want, I, want to, I want it to be as normal as possible for him to, to just bite a head of broccoli out of the garden with, with, with no care and, and reason, but just because of the fact that that is food that is growing from the soil that we are, we are building. Um, it is interesting for, for, for my youngest one who puts everything in his mouth uh, because I'm, I'm with my three-year-old and I turn around and he has a fistful of mulch in his mouth, which is not always easy to tell the wife what happened, to tell my <laughs> wife what happened when I return. Um, so it's definitely a balancing act of exploring, imagining, creating, uh, discovering without uh, so much going in, in, mm. into the youngest mouth, but it's, it's beautiful, you know, like they, they are thirsty to be outside. They, they want to be in these spaces and uh, the more opportunities that I can create for them to participate in that and come to, uh, come with me to work. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not work. It's, it's sharing the joy of this, of, of this practice with, with my two younger ones. Um, it's, it's not the easiest for sure. Um, but it's, it's definitely worth the extra added effort. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful that your children have that experience and those teachings every day. And I feel super grateful that I, you know, this wasn't my childhood. I didn't compost as a kid. I didn't garden. And my mom, you know, offered us many beautiful things, but that wasn't the thing, one of the things that we were introduced to as a kid. And just feeling really grateful as a mom now and being able to offer those opportunities and spaces to my kids. And one of the, you know, really think something that I'm really called to do um, and something you kind of touched on a little earlier is like, how can we give these opportunities to other people and other communities that, you know, don't necessarily have the exposure? Um, and I feel like a little bit of that is kind of some light being shed on in some of the recent um, current events that are happening around like the systemic, uh, our broken systems, systemic racism, and, you know, just things that are happening in certain communities that don't happen in others. And again, opportunities that some communities have that other communities don't. And I feel like that's really showing up a lot for me right now in terms of what, you know, we have access to and what some people are privileged to have and, and not others. So I know that's kind of a long winded statement, but just I'm curious about, you know, LA compost and, you know, pers well, we, you personally and LA compost, like how, um, what's showing up for you guys around Current, the current events with um, kind of the racial injustice that's showing up and, and systemic or systemic problems. I know it's been work, obviously work that's things that have been around for a long time. And I know I really see you guys doing that work, but yeah, just curious about what's, a, what's a, being illuminated right now. Yeah, um, I think what's, what's really wonderful is how people have stepped up um, in, in this season and this time, but also, um, are recognizing the disparity in resources and access that it's like that exists throughout the city by design, uh, not by accident. Um, 
I think for me, it's, it's twofold. I'm seeing kind of like the beauty of LA from the way that people are sharing and providing resources in the form of seeds, fruits and vegetables from their gardens, uh, cooking meals with families again. But at the same time, I'm also seeing a huge shift in resources that are needed uh, specifically in communities of color throughout LA. Um, and what role are we playing in that? And how are we supporting with that? Uh, as far as new gardens, new green spaces, farms that are trying to build their soil and perhaps we have the ability to support them in that, like how are we showing up? Um, one of the projects I'm really excited about in regards to building not just resilience, but true community health is, is this program focused on uh, like a, a soil farmer program in proximity to one of our hubs. One of our compost managers is born and raised in the area that is serving the space. And essentially we are uh, providing water catchment systems, food growing infrastructure and soil building infrastructure for 10 to 20 families uh, to be able to do that on like a block with a, like from like a block approach. And um, I think for that, it's building, um, building a strong network within a small area uh, to, to lean and rely on one another. Another thing that we're doing right now is passing through any resources or uh, any resources and materials and support and supplies that we have within our general network to communities in need. We've, we've given away more compost than we've ever given away in the past three months, um, just in regards to the amount of requests. We're doing what we can to support uh, supplies and pitchforks and tools and materials. Um, but also being present, you know, there's, there's a lot of people wanting to learn right now. It's, it's hard to do that by not being outside. But um, I think for me, it's this, this, this time and this season has been a huge moment of reflection and realizing the state of things, the state of broken systems and how we don't want to go back to what was because that was not normal. It's, it's, it's an incredible opportunity to create something that is brand new, that is regenerative, that, that has everyone in mind and that provides the resources and and essentially is looking at it from like a lens of equity and, le and, and looking at it in a way of um, how are we establishing equitable practices that uplift everyone and not at the expense of, of someone else kind of thing. So um, I'm very much leaning on organizations that are also doing this in their own communities and supporting how I can versus uh, coming in and saying what needs to be done. Um, but I'm excited. I think the, the, this season of exhaustion and unrest is creating something that is going to be profoundly impactful and beautiful in regards to how communities are creating health and wholeness for themselves um, and are relying on one another and are creating a new narrative that um, uplifts the people who weren't often at the table, whose voices often weren't heard. Um, and in, oftentimes the role that we play is is allowing for other voices to, to, to be heard during this time and not mm -hmm. having our voice always be at the front of the conversation, showing up as we see fit, but also supporting um, the work and efforts and energy of, of others who, who are making, making leaps and bounds within this area as well. Thank you. Beautiful. Michael, this is, you know, you, you, you have a really beautiful, eloquent way to describe things and express yourself. And I really appreciate that. And I just, um, you know, one of the things that we're always as an organization trying to distinguish is, you know, the idea of if sustainability is enough and what is regeneration, what is the distinction between sustainability and regeneration um, as you see it and as, you know, as someone who's really bringing compost and community together around compost, you know, what do you see is um, the effect, the regenerative effect of um, compost and uh, the regenerative effect of bringing people together around compost? Yeah, um, when, you, when you say the word sustainability, the first thing that comes to mind is like, if the three of us were to walk into a revolving door, right, a rotating door, it's literally like we're moving, but like we're literally like staying in the same same place. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the crack in the glass or the opening in that revolving door is is the path of regeneration. It's the the path to have options, the path to create to create life and and move forward from just staying and moving in the same place. And for me, it's how do we create those paths and opportunities for everyone to have access to those decisions, access to those resources to create their own 
narrative that is reflective of their culture and uh, historical practices in many ways. Um, I think for me, it's, I, I keep going back, like our tagline is soil and people. And I think for me, it's like, I use compost as a metaphor in any way, because the pile, the compost pile takes, you know, what many consider broken or imperfect, and it allows it to participate in this beautiful process of decomp decomposition. Um, but I think it's the diversity of the pile, the fact that the compost pile does not discriminate and invites communal imperfections and brokenness to kind of transform mm. those materials into something that is life-giving. And then once it's finished, the compost is never asked to be celebrated. It kind of just is spread out to support and breathe new life into the development of future growth. So when I think of it like that, I see the compost pile as a mirror for what is possible at the community level. Uh, people seeing themselves not as perfect or whole, uh, but they are made whole through the ability to coexist well in an inhale, exhale experience with their neighbors of like, we are essentially mimicking the process of compost at the at a human, at a community level. And then once that wholeness is achieved, it's not like, oh, we, we made it, like, look at us. It's like, how can we support the next, the next group of individuals or next, next compost batch on their journey, on their process? And, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a constant cycle of uh, growing and moving and shaping things to, to thrive. Um, but I, I get excited because I'm just one piece of, of, of many. Um, and whether I'm holding the space and showing up as a facilitator or I'm showing up as, as someone who's just ready to do the work alongside others, um, there's so much life and energy and excitement around building both the soil and souls across LA of allowing for uh, spaces to be created that are safe, that represent the community and that allow for life to create but also just transfer to transfer that life to receive and, and to give in that inhale exhale exchange that I kind of mentioned um, but I think the more we kind of see the earth as part of our own self and our own suffering I think the more um, creative and imaginative we, we we can begin because it's not this separate effort it is it is it is us it is it is part of us and I think um, the more people recognize and, and understand and see that as as, as true um, the ways they show up and the offerings that they provide are, are, are so beautiful mm. yeah it makes me makes me think of uh, farmer Rishi one of the beautiful things that he oftentimes says is having people see their body as you know the body of the earth that that um, the body of the earth is their body um, or you know a reflection of that and that's so what yeah what i'm what i'm what i'm hearing in your reflection yeah it's it's really really beautiful um we we have uh well a couple couple more questions and then um yeah a couple more questions uh jessica you want to ask the question the what yeah the the number nine question <laughs> <laughs> yeah i want to say before i ask you that just want to acknowledge you for just your wisdom and, and your leadership and it's just really inspiring because you're approaching your work in a, in a in a place of you know just really helping to hold the people around you up and making space for them and and as you, you mentioned and you just what you stated earlier and you know every day looks different in time in terms of the hat that you wear it's not like i'm the founder of la compost and this is what i'm doing i'm up here it's like all of those every every role in the work that you do is is vital to help your organization move forward and just really acknowledging you for, you know, holding space and stepping into, you know, the different, the different shoes that make sense at the given time. So it's really, thank really you. powerful and inspiring. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and the question I'd love to know is just, what do you, what are you most excited about um, with LA Compost and what, and, and from a space of, you know, what's might be on the horizon and yeah, what are you working towards in terms of uh, next, next steps and projects? Yeah, this, it's been definitely a journey and there's been so many, you know, levels of growth and um, exciting partnerships and opportunities. But I think this year and the next year as well, is just, it's, 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 it's really exciting because when we started this work, we were kind of told that what we were doing was illegal in regards to moving things here and doing things here and, mm -hmm. and, 
uh, I'm a firm believer that the same people that oftentimes think you're crazy are the same people that kind of sing your praises six, seven, ten years down the road. Um, <laughs> yep. But we we just got written into like the city's Green New Deal plan as far as establishing like community partners and being mindful of where we send our materials because there really is no such thing as a way. So even if a city like Los Angeles starts to compost, where are those materials being sent to? Which communities is it affecting along the way as well as its final destination? And mm -hmm. for us, we're really thrilled to work with the municipalities, with the sanitation department, with potentially Rec and Park to, to, to imagine what it looks like to build local solutions that uplift, that create new jobs, that allow people to be proud of keeping these resources in their own zip code. So we're really excited about that. We're also excited about uh, this is the first year that the state, Cal Recycle, has put a grant opportunity uh, to build community composting and specifically in green spaces throughout the state. Um, and we were a part of that successful award that will be starting this year. Mm -hmm. um, it's a collaboration that we are a part of as, as part of the California Alliance for Community Composters. Uh, it's fiscally sponsored by People, Food and Land. And uh, yeah, we're gonna be establishing 50 new locations um, from Northern California down here and down LA and San Diego and everywhere in between, uh, creating new jobs, creating new spaces and, and showing that this model not only works, but can thrive and can build human wholeness, resilience and soils along the way. And hopefully it be a model for other states to follow across the country. Um, so we're really excited to work, work on that. There was a lot of energy from our team uh, that went into that. Um, we're also part of another opportunity that's kind of focused on accelerating uh, climate resiliency throughout Los Angeles. Um, and that's a project specifically in South Los Angeles in both Watts area, as well as surrounding areas that's gonna focus on listening to the community, um, identifying spaces that they'd like to uplift um, and empower and allowing them to be kind of, allowing them to hold the keys as far as where that's gonna go and allowing us to just pass the resources um, to them. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of exciting things that are going on from like policy changes to working with cities, to working with states, to uh, a growing list of compost hubs wanting to start up, but it's very much like wanting to work well and not just build for the sake of building mm -hmm. um, and being okay with having a moment of rest. Um, I'm, I'm, I think what's really exciting during this time of kind of like not being outside as much and is, is it's, allowing us to restructure and re realign and recalibrate our internal ethos as an organization. How is our mission, vision, principles, and values, the collection of the voices, not only on our team, but of our community as well. Um, and really allowing us to, really allowing this time to be that realignment so that when we are outside building and communicating and hosting workshops and work days, it's, it's with the renewed energy that we were able to kind of create during this season. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's no shortage of exciting work on the table for us. It's 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 a matter of doing it well um, and in, and and ensuring that um, it's it's benefiting everyone along the way. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah, when you you know you you're reflecting on just the stillness and the time to do the inner work. I feel like we're in that same space right now, and it's beautiful because it, I feel like it parallels just the cycles of of nature. There's, there's stillness and there's times to kind of go inward and, and be still for that internal growth um, for the, the season of, of the fruits um, and harvest. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful time in reflection and congratulations. That's, it's amazing work that you're doing and to bring compost to more people. Did, so you said that there, there is a plan for 50 hubs in the state of California, five zero or five, one five? Five zero, yeah. So uh, I'm hoping it's the start of, of many years of funding from the state to allow this work to grow and, and to expand in, in all communities. Um, but yeah, we're working on creating a, a statewide training program for anyone wanting to do this work, kind of creating the resources and tools needed to, to make this process as, as seamless and, and easy as possible. Um, we're even working with like app developers to like figure out not figure out, but really improve on systems as far as tracking the compost pile, improving the process of the compost pile anywhere you're at. So we're really excited that this grant's gonna allow us to expand on this work, um, work with state part, like work with other community composters across the state and really show what's possible uh, when when the crumbs of funding allow for, for this work to be done. You know? 
It's about time. That's awesome. Wow, that's a huge. That, that that's a really really exciting. Um, yeah. Wow, what an exciting chapter that is on uh, in the on the horizon. That's really really extraordinary, Michael. Um, beautiful. We have a couple more questions. One uh, is just kind of one of the things that kiss the ground our team. We take our team through the process of really connecting to what our calling in life is. So one of the questions that we like to ask our guests on the We Can Do This podcast is, uh, how would you articulate uh, what's your calling in life, Michael? Yeah, um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a deep question for sure. Um, <laughs> I, I would say my calling in life is to carry the baton that was passed on to me from my family that, that ran the marathon before me and hold it well um, in a way that furthers my sons and their sons and their kids' ability to just do life well and well with others. Um, I, I wanna create uh, a space and reality for not only my family, but for everyone that I engage with to, to have the things that, that, that we all desire and that we all should have access to. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of twofold in regards to that calling. It's, it's holding the baton well from my grandfather and father who passed it to me. And it's creating the space and opportunity for people to be still and experience life in the way that they should be able to experience it in regards to sitting under a tree, having access to green spaces, uh, having access to clean water, healthy soil, healthy air. It's, it's not doing much. It's essentially kind of looking at the way that systems exist and figuring out how human wholeness can be achieved through the collective efforts of those that are participating in this journey, in this, in this walk, in this life. Um, I mean, my calling's changed, I feel, now that I'm a father. I feel like my, the first thing that comes to mind are, are my kids and just like what it is I'm creating for them and thinking about them more than I just think about what it is I'm doing for myself. But um, yeah, how do I, looking at it back from like the seed perspective, how do I water the seed that was planted years ago? How do I compost the soil that was being built years ago? And how do I set it up in a place for the people that come after me to, to continue to steward it in a really profound and beautiful way that continue the journey and continue the story. So yeah, I know that's not a specific answer, but how do I just use my time on earth to, to steward what has been given to me in a way that passes it along to the next, um, Beautiful. I, 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 I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm touched by that, by your, your answer, and yeah, just the, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the simplicity, the clarity, and the beauty of uh, the recognition of uh, being part of a continuum, and being, uh, yeah, having that continuum be uh yeah the it, honoring that succession of life that you're coming from um is what i hear and it's really yeah thank you uh and the last the, la the last question that we ask every guest is because this is again we're, we're we're about sharing hopeful optimistic narratives about how we can heal and regenerate so um the last question is, uh, how can we do this? <laughs> yeah. Um, as I was speaking and as you were speaking, I, 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 a, a prayer kind of entered my mind as far as like um, a prayer that was um, an ode to Oscar Romero. And uh, maybe I'll just share that in regards to how I feel like we can do this or how I feel like we can try to do this. Um, the prayer is, uh, it's, it's titled Prophets of the Future, Not Our Own and it reads it helps now and then to step back and take a long view the kingdom is not only beyond our efforts it is even beyond our vision we accomplished in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is god's work mm. nothing we do is complete which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us no statement says all that could be said no prayer fully expresses our faith no confession brings perfection no pastoral visit brings wholeness. 
No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they will hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of the future, not our own. Mm. And wow. when I think of like, we can do this, it's, it's do something and do it well. Know that it's not on your shoulders. Know that there's people that have come before you. There are people that are here with you now. And there are people that are going to continue the work that you've 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 contributed to so um yeah so in the context of a garden or in compost you know it's those that have planted the seeds those who will water and those who spread compost to support the growth it's uh kind of continue to search to figure out what brings you life so that you may overflow like that goodness onto others as well hmm. wow that's so profound thank you michael I've, i actually had never heard that before and it gave me Amy Goosebumps. I, got, I definitely want to read that many more times over again. You, so you have that by memory or that was something that you had up near you? I pulled it up because I only have like three lines memorized as far as like the mantra that I've kind of taken with me, but uh, I just pulled it up and, and, and talking about watering the seeds that were already planted, that, that prayer came to mind. So I was like, oh, I, would, I would like to share that if possible. Thank you. Thank you for that gift. Um, wow, that was that. Thank you, Michael, for your time. This has been a really, really enriching, beautiful, inspiring conversation. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just really awed by your, um, yeah, your humility and your kindness and your grace of which you communicate, and knowing that you're, you know, that you're also, you know, moving something powerfully forward. So, just want to hugely, um, yeah cheer you on and champion you and as an organization kiss the ground you know we are here to support you and feel you know know that you can count on us to yeah however whatever resources or support or don't don't hesitate to reach out and to you know call upon us for support and we really admire what you're doing yeah likewise i feel like the fact that we occupy similar spaces in la i feel like uh i appreciate you know the kindness, the respect, the, uh, the openness to collaborate. And, you know, we've worked um, partially with some of your team members and it's just been nothing but great experiences. And I know that it's just going to continue as far as uh, working on this, on this work. Um, but yeah, I appreciate the time that you both took to have this conversation. Uh, that, that offering is also uh, extended to you in regards to how we can support your work and your efforts. So uh, very much so looking forward to collaborating. Thank you. Continue yeah. building the soil in the in the communities together. I love it. Yeah, I always, I always, I always kind of like think about like soil and soul, right? The only letters that separate those two words are you and I. It's just like mm. it, it's 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 just it's so close, and it's both both are viewed as sacred and are going to continue to be uplifted together. So uh, excited to do that along both you and and the larger community across LA. Beautiful, awesome. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation and really has enriched the rest of my day. I can see we'll be uplifted by this conversation. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch soon. Awesome. Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, one, of our, uh, one of our final thoughts on the We Can Do This podcast is just the gentle reminder that Kiss the Ground is a nonprofit organization. And so if uh, you're not a member and you love the work that we're doing, um, please join our membership and it can be joined as low as a $1 a month. Um, and we just are grateful for your participation and we want to be the remembrance that we can do this. So thank you everyone and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day.